Welcome to Talk Art. I'm Holly Van Hart, and I'll be your host as we delve into the fascinating world of Silicon Valley's finest artists. Talk Art is sponsored by Silicon Valley Open Studios. Every year, during the first three weekends of May, hundreds of local artists open up our studios to the public. To learn more, please visit svos.org. Our guest today, Katie Morton, is a painter who is inspired by the skies and lights of Beijing, China. Katie grew up in Palo Alto, went to Palo Alto High School, and earned an art degree, a Bachelor of Fine Arts, from the Maryland Institute College of Art. And then Katie set out on a huge adventure to China. Welcome, Katie. Hi, Holly. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, let's start there. Tell us about China and what drew you to China. Well, as you just said, I did grow up in Palo Alto and then moved to Baltimore. And one of the things that really changed for me was the color palette. That if you look at a lot of the Bay Area figurative artists, so for example, Diebenkorn, his palette has a lot of pastels. And what you see around San Francisco is that a lot of the houses have these really strong, you know, pastel rainbows everywhere. Well, also San Francisco is full of rainbows, but yes. Um, and then when I moved to Baltimore, everything was brown, it was reds, it was all the colors of brick. And neither one of these color palettes quite fit with how I saw the world. And then I visited Beijing only for one week and I had never felt more comfortable in my own art. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, well, if that is the case, I should probably move there. And one of the things about it is that Beijing does have a lot of smog and the color palette that I loved so much was this cool, cool color palette. And so it was the grays of the pl air pollution matched with the bright neon reds of all of the businesses. Wow, how interesting. So how did that come out in your art? Well, actually, a lot of what I ended up doing was also finding that the compositions of the city of Beijing matched with my sense of composition. I'm very, I'm very short, I'm five foot tall, and I've always felt very constricted in my physical form. And that was one of the things that in Beijing, you have little fences around all of the streets, all of the buildings, and it felt very homey to me. I said, oh, wait, this is how I feel in my body, kind of constrained with little fences. And that's also how, if you look at paintings, that the picture plane is also constrained by, you know, your stretcher bars. And Ooh. that actually affected a lot of my paintings from there. Wow. Well, let's take a look at some of your paintings. So this is Hunan House. Hunan is a province in the south of China. And one of the things I was talking about the composition is you can see in the top of it, it has the white, the roof line. And the line, even though every time I try to hang it, it always feels like it's a little off. So I always think like, well, is it, do I use a level? And when I use a level, it's actually in fact quite squared away. But because I've changed the roof line to be at a slight angle, what you end up having is this slight discomfort, but you don't actually necessarily register it. It's more of an emotional response when you look at the painting. And that's one of the things that I really, really, really spoke to me is that a lot of the buildings are old and, in, in older cities and you have you know stones that are crumbling and you do have a lot of these angles that are a little bit off and so that's what I'm playing with here and also the color of blue that you notice that in uh, the south of China especially in Hunan there's this very specific blue that gets used and so again changing my color palette and looking to the city for inspiration it also has a an amount of loneliness that changing countries, of course, I was in Beijing for four years, but changing countries, you are, you know, somewhat alone. And that was one of the things attracted me to the city is being surrounded by people, being surrounded by a very, very bustling, you know, cosmopolitan area, but at the same time finding that inner, that, that solitude. And so you have these darkened windows and you have abandoned spaces that before I moved to Beijing, I was doing a lot of figurative work. And then I got to Beijing and I started doing, looking to the city. Uh, so for this painting, it actually, my, uh, there are a lot of huge buildings, of course, skyscrapers. My apartment building right across the street was this huge mall. And my studio is actually, was actually in my apartment. I really like having a studio in my home space because my paintings end up feeling more like me because I'm not going somewhere else and painting. Um, and so for this one, there is a, was a school across the street in the, you know, in the building. 
uh, in the shopping mall, and it would always flash. It was at, uh, probably in elementary school, and it would flash these neon lights, literally daytime, nighttime, it doesn't, 24 hours a day. And so I would wake up to these lights being projected on my wall. And so this is one of the paintings I made in the middle of the night in response to the colors that were coming through. And again, you also see the angles, you know, slightly off, also talking to the kind of claustrophobia of, you know, being a small human in, uh, you know, in a big world. Yeah. What were those lights doing on so often? I honestly <laughs> don't know. They just, you know, advertising. The thing is that the city is so large and there's so many people that lights are just constantly on. You just, you are surrounded by life at any time of the day. So the hallway, this was painted based on a construction site in the old alleyways in the old areas of Beijing, and they're called hutongs. And one of the things that I, I passed by at night were these construction workers, that had, they had it lit that they couldn't do construction during the day because it would be disruptive. And this is actually also based on a school space. And so I ended up taking, taking that and doing a few drawings and then painting from the drawings. And you can see, I was talking about loneliness and taking out the figures, but at the same time, there's a little, a shadow of a figure projected on the wall. And in that school, there was a bust of, I believe it was a political figure, although I do not believe it was Mao. I couldn't actually get in. There was a fence, so I couldn't get over the fence. But uh, projected on the wall. So again, talking about the loneliness and the darkness and how the shapes move in. And I actually made this painting for a show in an old abandoned uh, graphic design building. Granted, I say old, but it was only about five years old. However, it hadn't been built with the best material. So the whole thing was crumbling. And some of the walls that should have been 90 degrees were more like 70, mm -hmm. which is not ideal if you're having a big <laughs> opening. So, you know, it was a group show. I had this painting. I said, oh, the lines of my painting match the lines of the building. But we were also a little bit concerned about the safety. So whenever, when you entered the show for the opening, you got a glass of wine and a hard hat. <laughs> this painting, The Bridge, is, I think best speaks to how I feel about my time in Beijing, that this is when I started painting my smogscape series. And you can see along the skyline right above the bridge, there's a haziness, a grayness. And the grayness is, you know, one of the ways that I can tell whether or not the air was clean to breathe. I would look out my window and I would see whether or not there was smog in the air and whether or not I should go outside or whether, you know, more of my style stay inside and paint. I, I loved painting the smog. But below the bridge, you see that it's very clear. And in, on one side, for me, it was that the smog was the beauty and also the projected image that either the city or, you know, would talk about in propaganda often was sort of more clear, the, the version that you would see in Olympics videos with the clear sky. And then up in the Beijing that I knew, that I loved, it was, it was the smogginess. And was this taken in, oh, sorry, was that painted in of a morning or an evening? Evening, that evening. was a sunset. And it was also right near the art districts in Beijing uh, sort of have moved out. There are several, and they move out as the government cracks down on them. And mm. that one was based in the, around the area where Ai Weiwei, if you know the dissident mm. artist, where, near where his studio is. Mm. So, uh, this painting is, again, in the Smogscape series, and you can... What you see in the very foreground is the window frame from my studio out into across the street to where the flashing lights were. Um, across the street is the mall. And then a, a several story tall propaganda poster that I would see every single day. So you actually find these rectangles popping in so that the bright red, or like the dark red and the hammer and sickle. You also see the skyscrapers. And then beyond that is a small line of another level of the city and then the mountains. And based on how much of that I could see, I would decide whether what the air quality was and whether or not I should just stay and paint. And so for this one, I could actually probably tell from my paintings what the air quality was for the day. So what was it that day? This wasn't, I, this was not too bad of a day. This was probably about, you know, the PM 2.5 was probably in the hundreds, a little bit past 100. So, not, not good by American standards, really great by Beijing standards. Uh, but I, I love the smell of coal, so you know, no complaints. I, I love Beijing. This is again out of the same window, and you can see that gray rectangle is the same propaganda poster.
and this was not a good day. You can tell that you cannot see anything really beyond the shopping mall right there. Uh, so th this was, you really can tell. I have many in, these, in this series, and you can really tell what my experience was like based on these. Then when I came back, I came back after the four years, and I started doing larger, more in-depth paintings. This one is based on the smaller smogscapes that I had. Um, again, with the rectangle of the propaganda poster. And playing with, any, there are it's kind of lines of small neons at the bottom below the propaganda poster before you hit the road. And the idea that playing with how the air affects the lights and the fact that the city really is with these neons, they are, you know, alive. They're calling to you. You know, it's the way that food is described in China is very much, you know, this, you know, this flavor plus this meat. And it just always makes your mouth water. So, you know, yeah. This is based out of the, the pre previous art district. So not the one where Ai Weiwei is. He's a little bit farther out, the one before that. So 798, right near where I lived. And you can see, again, some of the similar compositions to what I was dealing with in my other paintings. And then a face that gets carved out of the bushes, having, giving the city a bit of a voice. Well, very beautiful work, Katie. Thank you. Uh, tell us about your process for making these paintings. So it actually changes a little bit. I end up doing drawings and paintings from life a lot. And then sometimes I end up doing my paintings from my drawings. One of the things that I did when I was in art school was make master copies. And I, a master copy is essentially you go and you look at either a photo of a, ma a painting done by a master artist or you go to a museum. When I was in art school, we would always, we would go to the National Gallery. And I'm not sure if you've ever seen this, but sometimes you'll have, you know, artists will get an easel and they'll be painting there and you'll think, well, how on earth did they get there? But I was one of those people and it was great if you ever get the opportunity. So one thing I started doing was doing my own drawings of masterworks. So this was actually, I went to the Bernard Show at the Legion of Honor in San Francisco. And I was really curious. One of the things I want to do from master copies is learn how the artist thinks, what the composition, what the colors are like. And so what I was really interested in was the fact that we normally, when we see paintings, we see a, a rectangle, right? We see four corners. And here, he wasn't dealing with that format. So how does he deal with that? You can see how the mountains end up mirroring the top of the canvas. And I was really curious, right, again, how he works with these color palettes. And so this is another painting a couple more paintings that he did. And again, very different palettes, but, it, but still his work. And it's really interesting what you learn, because we don't, when we look at art, we look at it for what? A few seconds when we go to a museum. There's so much to take in. And even if we're taking a photo, even, even less time. And so I, was, I started to draw this. And I didn't actually know what I was looking at. And I drew, there's a woman here looking down. And I couldn't tell what I was drawing until I'd drawn it. It's a dog. She's looking at her dog. And I had no idea of base. I was looking at the painting, but I couldn't even tell. So master copies can teach us a lot. So I figured if I can do it for you know, artists like Bernard, I can do it for myself. This painting, or this drawing, is what inspired the hallway where there was the, you know, the construction painting with the bright lights. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about that shadow from the bust. And here it is. But you notice that there are actually figures from the construction work. And I decided that based on my drawing, I didn't like how they worked. So I took them out for the final painting. Then we have these drawings. This one is the same drawing I just showed you. That's uh, the hallway. This one down here is the bridge where it had the reflection underneath sure, the bridge. Yeah. This was a third painting, and I was trying to decide with these master copies whether it worked well in a series. I decided it didn't. That painting never got made. And the, the other two did, obviously. The we other saw those earlier. Yeah, yeah, we saw those earlier. Yeah. And the first painting ah. you saw of the Hunan house, this was how I was deciding. You can see how there's that sort of doorway, but mm -hmm. notice that it's not in the top one. And that's because I decided it, it needed to be there. And so I added in, an, and you can see from here that this was the final drawing before I made the painting. And it worked. And I just wanted to show you a couple of other artists and their color palettes. This is Watteau. And he's very detailed, but again, you can see how different color palettes work for different, different artists. Now, museums are very picky about what uh, art materials you're allowed to bring in they and are. sketch with. So what, what do you bring in to do these sketches? Uh, for these, I tend to use colored pencils. Um, I also have used, I have used crayons. I, for the 
uh, Bernard paintings at the Legion, I didn't actually have any materials and I was so moved that I went to the gift shop and I immediately bought the nearest coloring objects and the nearest sketchbook. That's and great. so, yes. And, but I have, been, I have been told to cease and desist when I had pens. <laughs> Pens. Museums. Pens, right, because they're more permanent. Hmm. So they're worried that if I put it on the artwork, it'll be, right, yeah. it won't be good. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Yep. Fascinating. Great, and now you're going to show us uh, another image of your paintings? Mm -hmm. Great, yes. So this painting I did after I came back from China, and I'd been doing the smogscapes, and I was really curious about sort of how Again, master copies, like how do other artists deal with the same subjects that I'm dealing with? But the thing is that when you look to artists who are dealing with atmospherics and dealing with smog, you get Turner, you get Manet, you get Monet, you get or Bellows, and what happens is that they're old enough that they don't have the neon. So you do get the smog, you get industrialization, but you don't have the bright lights. So the only place I could find this was in sci-fi films. So I started to look into sci-fi films to really inspire inspire the same ideas. And so this is a painting that I did. It's three different heads. I'm not sure if you can tell, it's very abstracted. And in the top one, there's, there's atmospheric, so the pink background is kind of hazy around him. The middle one is the darkness that's eating into the face. And then the third one, it's a young woman smoking a cigarette. And so her face is mostly obscured. Mm. And I really liked looking to these dystopian, futuristic, spaces for inspiration. Hmm. Great. So we've seen uh, your finished paintings and we've seen your initial sketches. Mm -hmm. What happens in between? Well, in between, you get, and this is in the same line as the sci-fi sci film, or master copy inspired painting I just showed you. And this is from one of my favorite films, uh, Fantastic Planet. And it's inspired by that. And what I really loved is that you have a narrative going on, that you have a young mother and her child and you have sort of the alien figures and the alien figures have been playing with these human vermin in essence and it ends up killing or the mother the mother doesn't survive and so one of them takes on the human child as a pet and so looking to these sci-fi films started getting me interested in how do the societies work together as well as just I thought it was just going to be about atmospherics and then it became a lot a lot more that is a lot more complex <laughs> You're right. yeah and also the fact that with these you end up having a narrative that gets formed within the painting that normally when you look at a painting it's just one image and what I love about having these multiple panels is that you end up having multiple images that people look at back and forth so it actually creates a conversation within mm -hmm. one piece yeah, and tells I, a story. Exactly, yeah. 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 And the same here, that I've noticed that a lot of the imagery in these dystopian spaces end up use, using kind of the same tropes. Mm -hmm. So in the top you have uh, a computer screen mm -hmm. and how, how the imagery works across, across mediums. Mm. Fascinating. Great, and now we get to see a few more finished paintings. Yeah, what comes out of them. So what you see in the next painting is actually, that's two paintings. I, this is based on two paintings that I did in this previous inspired series, and I p overlaid them. So it was looking at the imagery and how, how do filmmakers or painters or artists in general deal with the subject matter of the unknown, right? The future you have in sci-fi, it's a bunch of people looking, trying to talk about something that no one knows, right? You're talking about an unknown future. And so trying to create that space myself and look at the, uh, the parallels. And then in this painting, you have three different films or three different film-inspired images. And I found it really interesting that, again, with this, people don't actually, we don't know what is to come. And it's really funny because we only are equipped with that which we know. And so if you look at a lot of sci-fi or dystopian futures, you see these suns, these orange suns, because that feels scary and futuristic to us. But you see it across the board in these. And also talked a lot with my sunsets and sunrises in Beijing, that it was dealing yeah. with these skyscapes and looking at 
how those how those work together. Kind of going full circle. Yeah, yeah. exactly. All of it all of it comes full circle. I'm constantly looking at sketchbooks. I'm constantly looking at you know I take notes along the way. My sketchbooks are half image, half writing, and so a lot of these are inspired by things notes I wrote to myself a long time ago. <laughs> So Katie, you're an artist and you also work in a gallery. Mm -hmm. So tell me how that might uh, influence your art or your art making. So the gallery I work in right now is fantastic. It's actually run by an artist and he, so you can actually really see the art, you know, the artistic eye in the way that the artwork is laid out or how it's chosen. Um, when I, one of the things that artists do a lot is go to, you know, residencies that, a residency is where you, you know, go to a program. It's like summer camp, but for adult artists. And then you just, you get a studio, you have visiting artists who come give lectures, and you just sit and paint. And so one of the things that I ended up doing was I went to this program, this amazing program, Vermont Studio Center in, in Vermont, right outside of Burlington. And they didn't have a group show, and I really wanted to see how the different artists work together. So I ended up curating a 30-person show while I was there. Mm -hmm. And it included not only artists who, that were at the residency, but also artists that were in the community itself. And I have always been very interested in the way that curation happens. That when you go to a museum, you don't really notice the curator's hand. Yeah, that, it's an art in itself, isn't exactly. it? Exactly, yeah. and ideally they do it invisibly, right? Mm -hmm. And ideally you are moved from painting to painting because they make sense together. But yes, yes. Yeah, so how did the curating uh, influence, if at all, influence your art after doing that? It actually changes how I think about my series. That mm. before I started doing curating, I didn't know how to make several paintings in one vein. And now when I look at my paintings, I think of them as a body of work. And that, so, you know, the, the paintings that I was showing you with the two panels are a body of work, mm -hmm. or you have the smogscapes are a body of work. And so in, with each one, you learn from each painting and what to do for the next one. Hmm. Great, great. And so what do you have coming up next, Katie, with your art? Coming up next, I am actually working to, because I have been doing a lot of figurative work in Baltimore, I have just, I am trying to marry those two together, that I have a series that I'm working on putting my figures into these futuristic spaces and with the, with the futuristic spaces trying to play with a lot of the things that I learned during the, the interim. Hmm. So are these sci-fi figures or human figures or both? Human figures, okay. they're definitely human okay. figures and a lot of them t playing with uh, art historical stories so, for example, if you look at Greek stories like, you know, Leda and the Swan, you see done over and over, or, you know, even, you know, Rembrandt has done so many, Gre you know, Greek myths, but playing with stories that are basically art historical parentage, what we've kind of come into, and hmm. almost like fairy tales, hmm. museum fairy tales. <laughs> <laughs> and are we going to see any threads of your China experience in those paintings? Definitely, definitely. There's always there's always a heavy dose of China, and that I hopefully intend to go back there in the future. We we shall see. But I I definitely felt more my art all of a sudden made made a lot of sense mm. while I was there. Mm. And you've been back for a few years uh, mm -hmm. from China. So how did your art change once you came back? When it came when I came back, I ended up doing a lot of well, mostly the sci-fi, mm -hmm. mostly the sci-fi pieces, but I started painting on paper. So when I was in China, I was working on canvases, and when I was in art school, I was working on canvases, but all of the paintings that I was showing you mm -hmm. on the easel are all on paper, and one of the really nice things about working on paper is that it's it's portable, and when, because I'm working with oils, I'm not sure, have you ever, you you also make art, are you, but yeah. you're working oils with oils? Oils on canvas. Oils yes. on canvas, yeah. right, mm -hmm. but you have to prime the canvas yes. first. Exactly, and so the same thing, that being very careful that if I don't actually prime the surface of the paper, the oil will just <laughs> eat into it and, yes, yes yeah. completely disintegrate. And so I take a layer of acrylic underneath, but I use a clear acrylic. Okay. Because a lot of my work is very physical and very material-based, and so I really love the texture of the paper and the color of the paper. Mm. And with the paint, a lot of my paintings are very physical, are very three-dimensional with the paint. And so I've actually, I'm not sure how much you can, you know, can see from some of these, but with the smogscapes, they're very 
they're very thick, very thick paint. Oh, and I, no, I couldn't see that. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so I'd always leave the window, I'd leave the window open because I was painting at home. And the, it was, you know, you need ventilation. Oil paints are not great for you. The fumes are not great for you in any yeah. case. Once they're dry, they're fine, but before that, not. And so I would leave the window open, even in the winter. So it would be snowing out, and I would leave the window open. I would have to put my gloves on, make some hot tea, and be painting next to an open, hmm. uh, open snowy window. Hmm. Wow. And is your next series going to be on canvas or on paper? Half and half. I'm, I'm working on both. I'm also working on a series of drawings and trying to make the, bring the master copy format into a bigger format, so making large-scale drawings mm. that then go and, become paintings. And so as you picture this, now with your curatorial hat on, as you picture this in a show, would you have the canvases and the paper work side by side? Yes, yeah, I, I definitely would. I think that they, they all work really well together. I'm really glad that I've had the different kind of experiences throughout my time, mm. but I'm trying to sort of make it all, bring it all together now as, yeah. a, as one voice. Yeah, very cool. So the work on paper is not like just a sketch for the later work. It is a, a, a full painting in itself and the same as the works on canvas are. Yes, yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. it definitely is. And one of the, it has been a very exciting process learning to work on paper that especially in art school I was always taught how to paint on canvas but working on paper having to stretch paper because mm. paper likes to warp and so having to I was carrying when I was at the residency carrying eight foot long wooden boards down the street on my own and people must have thought I was absolutely crazy <laughs> because then I would have to I was stretching four foot or five foot pieces of paper on the boards and getting it wet so it get, becomes taut and then priming it and then putting the oils. So there's a whole there's a whole process to it that I had to learn from scratch, but yeah. we've gotten there, trial and error. There were yeah. a lot of mistakes along the way. <laughs> and uh, very quickly, one last question. Is uh, applying the oil paints to the paper, does it feel much different than applying it to it canvas? It does, it feels mm. very different. When you apply to canvas, because the canvas really has a tooth, and so the paint gets caught in it, but on the paper, it sort of washes on very mm, differently. Like very smoothly. Mm -hmm. Ah, great. Wow. How Fascinating. Well, Katie, thank you so much for being here and sharing your amazing artwork with us on Talk Art. Oh, thank you so much, Holly.